title for the message today. It's free at last. Um, a phrase probably is best known, uh, free at last, free at last. Uh, thank God Almighty, we're free at last. There was a speech given by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. about 60 years ago, 61 years ago. Um, uh, if you haven't actually heard the speech, it's one thing to read, but if you haven't actually heard him deliver it, you ought to. Now, you can find it on, on YouTube. It's worth listening to. I'm not going to try to imitate him, uh, 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 but in any case, a notable piece of, uh, of, of, of speaking, free at last. And of course, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he was talking about uh, about segregation. He was talking about discrimination in our country that was uh, still very prevalent, uh, more so than it is now, uh, 60 years ago. But when we think about the freedom that he was talking about, he was talking about um, the, the equality uh, between black people, white people, other people, things like that. As we look into the Bible, we see even a greater freedom, a greater freedom than that. Because uh, it, the, the text today, if you open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, we'll, we'll just snatch a few verses out of here uh, as, we, as we go along, but then we'll move to some other places as well. But for a text, Romans chapter 8, the, the speech, you might know it better, it's known as his I have a dream speech. Uh, he said that phrase, I have a dream, that exact phrase, eight times. I said it another time, I still have a dream, uh, a ninth time. There were other words that he said, uh, but it could also, although he said that eight times, and it's become known as his I have a dream speech, he actually used a different phrase more than that. Ten times in the speech, uh, he said, let freedom ring, uh, which boils off of or, or is taken from, of course, uh, uh, my country, tis of thee. The, the end of that song, Let Freedom Ring. And then he ran across from the East Coast to the West Coast, from the North to the South, uh, various mountains or hills, uh, or in the case of Mississippi, mole hills, uh, where freedom should ring from. And so this idea, let freedom ring, I'm not sure why the speech became known as I have a dream speech, since that wasn't uh, the thing that he said the most. Uh, but in any case, that last phrase that he used, um, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty. We're free at last. Uh, as we look into the Bible, we will see, of course, Jesus came to set the captives free. That's part of what Isaiah had prophesied. That's part of what Jesus read when he quoted from Isaiah uh, the first time that he stood in the synagogue. He came to set the captives free. He came to open blinded eyes. He came uh, for uh, to, to right all that's wrong. The Bible says that he came to destroy the works of the devil. Uh, and that means every single one of them, uh, whether it's on a global scale or an individual scale, whether it's a stronghold that the devil has in our heart or whether it's in, in, in locked into our legal system or our economic system or whatever, Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. And what that means, of course, is that means there is no compromise between the two. Uh, there, there's not going to be any agreement. There's not going to be any kind of, uh, of, a, uh, of an understanding that the two sides come to. Christ will win. Uh, and the devil will lose, right? We read in the in the last book, of the Bible, uh, uh, right? Revelation. That's the Russian word for it. Uh, we we read in Revelation where the devil is ultimately bound and he's cast into the lake of fire. And we also read that all those uh, who are not found written in Christ's book, those who don't belong to Him, they also uh, will be cast into the lake of fire. And there will be no freedom there. But the, the freedom uh, that, that, that develops, that the, that the Bible mentions uh, in that same book of Revelation is a time in, in heaven, uh, an eternal state of bliss where there is no sorrow, there is no sadness, there are no tears, there is no pain, there is no death. All of these things to be free from all of them. It's a freedom that, that doesn't exist here on this planet. And it's a freedom that can't be legislated uh, the, the, the Supreme Court or anybody else, they can't, they can't enforce it because there is a more insidious, pervasive, all-encompassing uh, bondage that people are in, and that's sin, of course. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, at, well, if, well, actually, make uh, maybe the main point toward the end of the message, but along the way, this idea of freedom. Uh, you know, freedom is a beautiful concept. Uh, of course, it means different things to different people. Uh, freedom means I have no restraint. Freedom means I can do what I want. Freedom means no one is telling me uh, hours or places or things that are off limits to me. 
freedom is what can you say it's freedom <laughs> it's 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 just it, it's great uh, freedom can also be scary uh, when you first step out into uh, a place that you're not familiar with or enter a new stage of life when you don't have somebody there that that is there to give you any guidance and you're just on your own and now all the rest all the decisions rest upon you and the consequences as well right uh, sometimes that can be a scary stage having that freedom um the bible has a lot to say about freedom uh, uh beginning with what i what i mentioned that the devil or that that jesus came to destroy the works of the devil and so right off the bat we have a question as to we whether we want to build up something that jesus is going to destroy or whether we want to, on the other on on the other hand, live for Him, seek His glory, uh, fulfill His purpose for our life, lay up treasures in heaven that moth and rust can't corrupt, that can't be stolen, that won't decay in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and so, it's a very fundamental question. So, kind of like what we did last uh, last time when we talked about how God the Father, even in the Old Testament, is just like Jesus in the New Testament. Uh, today, we're gonna at, at least toward the end of the message. I want to give you a thought that maybe you haven't thought of before. Maybe you have. Uh, I'm not claiming that it's original or anything, but it was a, it was a, a striking thing to me. And so maybe it'll be striking uh, and have an impression upon you as well. So talking about freedom, first of all, let's just run through a list of some of the things, some of the freedoms that the Bible uh, talks about. Because, because when the Bible says, um, or, or mentioning again, uh, when Martin Luther King Jr., uh, in his speech, he talked about, you know, manacles of segregation and chains of discrimination. Those things aren't made out of steel. Those, they're not made out of iron. They're not physical things. They're not that kind of bondage. You know, that, that, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's gone. But there are still a lot of bondages. There are still a lot of chains that people suffer underneath. Uh, and they, they take various forms. One of them, just to, just to, get, the, uh, just to get us going, Proverbs chapter number 5, is one place where the Bible says this, uh, the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. His own iniquities shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. So you have sin uh, is, is the underlying thing that, that, that binds all these things together, right? Any kind of, of perversion of God's order, of God's intention, you know, His main command is that we love Him, and the secondary is that we love others, like we, like we love ourselves. Anything that violates that, uh, it's uh, it's it's bondage, it's 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 chain. It, we create by by engaging that stuff. We create consequences and burdens. You know, we we have we have guilt, and guilt is one of those things that can be devastating. Uh, this morning in in our morning service, we're, we're preaching through uh, Matthew, and we're up to chapter 27 and we did the first 10 verses today which is where judas iscariot comes back into the temple he he confesses uh, that he has betrayed the innocent blood and he he in response uh, the the pharisees the 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 the, the high priests and, and leaders they say basically that's your problem we don't care uh he throws he throws the money he'd received for betraying christ back down on the floor because he doesn't want the stuff anymore he, he doesn't want to have it. He doesn't want to spend it. He can't enjoy anything with it. Uh, for him, you can only imagine what kind of turmoil there was uh, in, in his life. Well, I mean, what would you do if the realization came to you that you had just betrayed God, that you had just sold uh, your Savior, the creator of the world, uh, into the hands of his enemies? And, of course, we understand Christ was only there because he allowed himself to be there. He could have. He could have. Uh, set himself free um, and change the situation anytime he wanted to. But that doesn't detract from the choice that Judas had made. That doesn't detract from his guilt. Jesus himself had said to him earlier, better for that man if he had never been born. That's a, that's a big thing to say. And sometimes we would maybe use a phrase like that lightly. Uh, or maybe you're threatening your sister or your brother or something, something like that over, over some issue. But when the all-knowing God says to somebody or says about somebody, better if he hadn't been born. Um, I, I, to me, I only see one thing. I see hell uh, in, in, in that statement. This person who would do such a thing, 
who has sold himself to do evil, who, who, who is the willing instrument of Satan and who has consequently shut himself off from God's word, God's will, there is no final receiving place for him other than the lake of fire prepared for the devil and, and those who, um, who work with him. So that being said, um, guilt. And you know what happened? You know, Judas, he couldn't find any relief in just unloading the money and saying, okay, I'm not going to spend it. Whatever his plan had been for, for that sum, uh, that, that was over. His dream, whatever it was, that bubble had been popped. He, he didn't want to go forward with that. So he left not being able to change the fact that he had betrayed Christ, not having any money. Uh, and again, I can only imagine what he was thinking, but in the, the Bible says he goes out and he hangs himself. He commits suicide because of the weight of guilt, because of the realization of the wrong he had done, because he knew that despite his best efforts, he could not undo what he had done. He was bound. He was trapped by his guilt. And so guilt, of course, is a powerful thing. And we understand that Christ is able to set us free from guilt. You know, you have, for example, the Apostle Paul, who himself had been a, a persecutor of Christ, of the church, who said, you know, I thought, I sincerely thought I, I should do many things against the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I thought I was serving God by, by going after uh, these, these people that were following him until his life was changed. You know, and, and Paul became a wonderful servant of Christ because he didn't allow his guilt. And he, 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 it's not like God wiped it from his memory. You know, he said he admitted that he was the, the chief of sinners. He admitted that he persecuted the church of God. But he says, but by God's grace, I am what I am. Uh, he, he knew that the grace of Christ, the forgiveness of Christ, was sufficient and God used him to write what he says in Romans that where sin abounded grace did much more abound what a beautiful verse that is and what a what a hope it gives to people who will only believe what God has to say instead of focusing inward instead of being embroiled in all of the mess and the turmoil and the, and the nastiness of what they have done Accept it, repent of it, be cleansed from it, and then go on. The next day, the new day, to let God work through us. Nobody can deny that God used Paul. Nobody can deny that God used Peter, right? And Peter, whether well, that's Matthew 27 and Matthew 26, that's when Peter had denied three times he even knew who Jesus was. Um, and so the Bible says at the last verse of that chapter that Peter, when he saw Jesus' eye, they, you know, eyes, eyes locked, he went out and he wept bitterly. He also was broken. He also was guilty. But he didn't hang himself. He was forgiven. He was reinstated. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he went on to serve the Lord. And so you have two guys that were in pretty similar circumstances, you know, two apostles walking with Christ, being with him all the time, both of them tremendous failures uh, in, in that sense. One lived and was ultimately martyred for Christ while the other took his own life that same, uh, that, that next day. The power of forgiveness. You know, and, and is there, I don't know, is there a more beautiful word in the English language than forgiveness? Somebody has hurt you and, 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 and you say to them, or you've hurt somebody, let's put it that way, you're on the receiving end, and they tell you, I forgive you. And they mean it, and you believe it, right? Because they can mean it, but if you don't believe it, you can still shuffle out of there from that meeting with your, with your heart heavy, and, and, and with your burden not relieved at all, and still beating up yourself, even though nobody else is chasing you, even though nobody else is out, is out to get you. You know, in Proverbs, I think it mentions that the righteous flee when no man pursueth. No, no, the wicked flee. I'm sorry. The wicked flee when no man pursues them. They're guilty. They're always expecting there to be somebody to catch them. There's an officer. There's, there, there's something. They're, they're going to be found out in their lies. 
And so they're always paranoid because they have a reason to be paranoid. They're guilty of something. But the righteous are bold as a lion. They don't have to fear because their heart is clear, because they're walking with God. And so this whole idea of guilt, you know, and, and the devil, obviously, if we do things that are wrong, guilt is a natural response of our conscience to, to indicate that we have departed from the right way. But the devil also is a liar. And oftentimes he'll accuse people and blame people and, and tell people things that aren't true to make them feel guilty about something that either they haven't done or something that they actually have been forgiven for, but they just won't let it go themselves. No one else, again, is going to beat them up for it, but they beat themselves up for it. And so, and so we're talking about freedom. We're talking about liberty, right? Free at last. And that's one of the things that people need to be freed from, guilt. Now, again, we're not saying people should just uh, forget about, uh, ignore responsibility, deny they've done anything wrong, and just say, yeah, I, I can do whatever I want. That's not it. But guilt that has been forgiven, guilt that has been atoned for, guilt that has been covered by the blood of Christ is guilt that God's never going to remember himself. And, and so we should let that thing go. So that's one of the things. Talking about free at last, being set free from our past. And, you know, that includes a whole lot of things. That can include not just things that you're guilty of. They can also include things that you have been the victim of. And as a result of somebody else's sin, you're paying the price. Uh, you know, somebody borrowed your car and totaled it. And so now as a result, you're out of a car. Or, I don't know, other things that are much worse than that. Other choices that other people have made that have involved you in their consequences maybe directly done against you and maybe just somehow you're you're the fallout right you're 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 uh, um, not the direct victim not the intended victim for this stuff that you suffer as a result on the side you know and there's a lot of things that the devil he wants people to have complexes he wants people to be wrapped up in themselves he wants people to be to be so tangled in all kinds of things, real and imagined, that they have done and that they have been the victim of and that aren't connected with them at all, that we need freedom. Freedom to worship God. You know, I mean, one of the things, people, people have the idea that God won't accept me. I'm so dirty. I'm so soiled. I've been so devastated. God doesn't want anything to do with me. And that is absolutely not true. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And so being set free, boy, it encompasses a whole lot of areas. Not just, not just physical you know, chains and, and, and bondages and things like that, but, but lots of different things. That's just one, talking about being set free from guilt. Romans chapter number five, let me give you, uh, let me give you another one. The uh, uh, Bible says here, uh, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, it goes on here later on in this chapter to say that if we were enemies, uh, if we were enemies, we were reconciled by to God by the death of His Son. Much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Uh, verse, uh, how's the verse here? Um, verse eight: God commends His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What I'm really looking for is not found in Romans chapter 5. It's found, found in Romans chapter 8, the first verse. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Okay, so we're actually here in Romans 8, where I uh, where I asked you to turn to at the beginning. But this I, here, here, here's a couple here. The law of the spirit of life has made me free from the law of sin and the law of death. Because death is a result of sin. You know, no, no sin, no death. We understand that. As you go down through this chapter, the Bible goes on to say, uh, to say in verse 7 that the carnal mind, that is the mind that is fleshly, the mind that operates what we would consider on a normal basis, um, the carnal mind is enmity. It's at war with God. It's not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. 
And if you read the rest of Romans chapter 8, and it's a, it's a tremendous chapter, there are some other verses scattered through here that at this point I don't want to take the time to pull out that talk about liberty, that talk about freedom, that talk about a, a different life that's available. But that's two of them. Uh, the fact that we have the law of sin and death. Another one, uh, in Hebrews chapter number two, the Bible talks about uh, fear of death. Let me read that one to you. Hebrews chapter two, verses 14 and 15. This is talking about Christ's incarnation. For as much then as the children, that is us people, are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them, that's us, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Are you afraid to die? That's a big one. Are you afraid to die? If that happened, whatever reason, airplane, terrorist, bomb, disease, heart attack, internal or external reason, are you afraid to die? You know what? Those who know that they have made their peace with God, those who have been washed by the blood of the Lamb, have been adopted into God's family, they should be able to say, no, I'm not. I'm not eager for the process, whatever that entails, to take place, but I'm not afraid of the result. I'm not afraid to step out of this life and enter into the next one. Fear of death. Fear of Fear of man. Here's one, Proverbs chapter number 29. I'm going to read a verse for you here, which I don't have marked. And then uh, mention a couple in the New Testament that Jesus said in conjunction with that. Proverbs chapter 29, verse number 25. The Bible says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Fear of man. Jesus said, you shouldn't fear those who are able to kill the body, but after that, have nothing else they can do. And we would, you know, a, a, a non-spiritual person would say, what do you mean after that? What more is there than killing the body? Isn't that the worst thing that we can imagine? Isn't that the, the ultimate? Jesus said, no, I'll tell you who you should fear. You should fear him who, after he has killed the body, has the power to cast you into hell. Fear him. Talking about God. Only God. And so the fear of man whether that's your boss, whether that's your spouse, whether that's your neighbor, whether that's, uh, I don't know, whoever it is, the fear of man brings a snare because we're only supposed to be fearing the Lord. We're only supposed to be seeking his will. Okay? So we have, we can be free from the, from the fear of death, free from the wrath of God, free from the fear of man. How about the fear of not having enough stuff? You know, starvation or whatever. Well, the Bible tells us there's only two places. It's interesting. I thought it was interesting. There's only two places in the Bible where you have the phrase, no good thing. Now, you can take that in two different ways. Um, you know, somebody who's no good, they're good for nothing, right? No good thing. That, that phrase appears twice in the Bible. Let me read those to you. First of all, in Psalm 84, this is the one that actually, um, actually is connected with the point that I just made uh, of, of not having enough. Of, of starving to death or freezing to death or something like that. Psalm 84, 11 is a great verse. Uh, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. We have a song we sing about that, that incorporates that. No good thing will he withhold. He will not keep any good thing back from those who are walking uprightly. You know, that doesn't leave anything out. That includes everything. No good thing. It's not just the things that you absolutely have to have to scratch by. No good thing. If it's good, if God knows it's good for you to have a million dollars, you're going to have it. If God knows it's good for you to lose your job, you're going to lose it. No good thing. That's a, that's a tremendous, that's another one of those all-encompassing promises. No good thing will he withhold. Now, the flip side of that, the other no good thing that the Bible talks about is found in Romans chapter 7. And in that, in this verse, Paul says, 
I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will, to desire, is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. He goes on to say, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. You know, in this chapter, uh, this chapter uh, winds up in verse 24, where he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Deliverance, that's what Paul was looking for. And of course, the, the, the last verse of the chapter, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Who, because the Bible says that Jesus is more than is able to make us more than conquerors in whatever whatever the issue is. So you have people, and, and again, you know this, Matthew chapter number six, the, the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus said that uh talking about uh good things, uh, that that what did he say? I better look it up because I'm drawing a blank. Matthew chapter six. That's one of those, it's one of those places. Uh, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt. Lay, up, uh, lay them up in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves don't break through or steal, where your treasures, there we are, be also. Um, and then later on in the chapter, if God clothes the grass of the field, how much more will he clothe you? Clothe you. Uh, therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's pretty clear. It's clear enough that we shouldn't misunderstand that. But do we believe it? Do we do it? Do we do we live our life in such a way where we're seeking God first and his kingdom and his will and then trusting him to fill in the details? You know, little things like where we're going to lay our head at night, what we're going to put in our mouth, what we're going to what we're going to get dressed in, you know, little stuff. Do we you know, do we have an eye problem? Are we magnifying the little things and minimizing the main thing? That can be a problem. That can be a problem. It's a perspective problem. It's an eyesight problem. And that can be corrected. So you have fear of God's wrath, fear of death, fear of man, fear of lack. How about this one? A fear of purposelessness. Well, and what I mean by that is not just your life, but also the things that happen in your life. And again, Romans chapter 8, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Full stop, if we were sending a telegram, right? Mm -hmm. All things. There, there's nothing that all things omits. It's all included. All things. And so the things that happen in our life that maybe seem random or seem like they have no, no purpose, they just come out of nowhere and bang. Why did this happen to me? Well, you know, we don't have to know where it came from or how long it's going to stay. We do have to, if we want to have peace, we have to trust that God knows what he's doing and that the God who has allowed this thing is the God who is regulating this thing and the God who will, in time, remove this thing. Because no good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly. Psalm 8411. That's a verse you should have on your refrigerator or in your heart, better yet. No good thing will he withhold. Okay, so we have random things. And so you, you've got you've got from different directions, you've got you've got life covered. You've got food, you've got clothing, you've got shelter, you've got your job, you've got you've got uh, problems that may arise, uh, whether you've committed them or whether it's been committed against you. Uh, it's all covered to be free from all these worries. Acts chapter 15, free from the law. You know, that's one of the, uh, one of the songs that we sing, free from the law, oh happy condition. Uh, right. Once for all is the name of the song. Christ has paid for it once and for all free from the law. In Acts chapter 15, uh, Peter uh, had uh, he was involved in a church conference because, of course, he in obedience to the Lord had taken the gospel to Cornelius, who was not a Jewish person. And some of the Jews back in Jerusalem were all up in arms about that, thinking that he had uh, he had done a really bad thing. 
And so Peter begins to explain how God led him there and God prepared Cornelius to receive his testimony. Um, and some of these other Jewish guys were saying, well, no, we got to take these Gentiles. We got to we got to tell them they got to keep the law, the, the law of Moses. And Acts 15, verse 10. This is this is too good for me to mess up. So I'll just read it. Acts 15, 10. Um, Peter responds and says, Therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. The yoke, the law that Peter himself admitted is unkeepable. That's a tough thing. An unkeepable law. But that's what God gave us. Because, because God's law reflects his character. God's law reflects his perfection. He says, if you want to be accepted to me, God who can't look upon sin, you just have to do this. Boom, be like me. We can't be like him. And so he became like us so that he could elevate us, uh, you know, and cleanse us by his blood. So the law, unkeepable. If somebody could keep it, they could be saved by doing that, but they can't keep it. It wasn't designed to be a, a way of salvation. It was designed to be a red flashing light. Danger, danger. You need a savior. Look over here. I'm going to send you one. And Jesus came. And so you have freedom from the law. Freedom from sin. We talked about that. Uh, other things. Let's, let's go on to talk about some other things. Uh, as we, okay, almost finish this up. Second Peter chapter number two. In this place, uh, it's a it's a discussion about some different things, um, sin and people's response to it. Uh, verse nine talks about the Lord being able to deliver the godly out of temptations and reserving the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. That's a scary thought. When God makes a reservation, when He reserves it, you, I got some place for you. Uh, don't want to be there. But the verse, the, the, the section goes on to say this, talking the verse, uh, they're false teachers, and, and there's a list here that describes them. Verse 19 ends up with this. They promise them liberty. They themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. False teachers that promise people liberty while they themselves are in bondage. This reminds me uh, of something, promising liberty, but being the servant of corruption. You know, way back in the beginning, and I mean the beginning, almost the beginning, anyway, in the Garden of Eden, when the devil was tempting Eve, and he set before her the single biggest, juiciest, most amazing promise that he could think of. Genesis chapter number three, you know what happens. But let me just emphasize a word here. And that is this. The serpent says to the woman, you know, she's already said, no, I can't eat that fruit because God's already told us that if we do, we're going to die. And the serpent says, you won't surely die. God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, drum roll, please, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. When the devil wanted to tempt Eve, way back when, he did not say, if you eat this fruit, you'll be just like me. He said, if you eat this fruit, you'll be like God. That was the goal. That was the, that was the uh, what do you call it, the hook? Um, the bait. You can be like God. And so here's the devil in a way, admitting that God is greater than he is because he doesn't tempt Eve with being like him. He says, you do this, you'll be like God. That was, that was what he dangled in front of her, and she bit, and we're suffering as a result. Of course, you know, Adam's involved in that as well. And so as we get close to wrapping things up, a couple of other things that we can say about freedom. Th 
the devil's idea, the devil's lie that he propagates in so many different forms is that God wants to restrict your freedom, that God wants to squash your happiness, that God wants you to, uh, I don't know, be a monk or, or, a, or a monkus? What's a, not a monk, but a lady monk. What do you call her? A nun. A nun. Right. Okay. Yeah. I do this in Russian. I, I make my own words up so that they don't come to me. Okay. So he wants you to be a monk or a nun and, and that kind of stuff. But you know what? That's not the deal. The deal is God wants to set us free. Now, when I say this, let's, let's think about this for a second. Think about people that have an addiction, whatever it is. Are they free or are they not? They're not. They're bound. They're in it deep and sometimes don't think they can get out. And, and maybe they try and they fail and they try and they fail. And sometimes it's a lifetime battle, right? They made the choice of their own free will, more than likely, you know, whatever it is, eventually to get into it and then fall deeper. And now they're now they're hooked. Like in Proverbs, it says, hold them with the cords of their own sin. Um, they're not free. And yet Jesus wants to set them free. I think about I think about if you if you have somebody who's addicted to to a substance, you know, whether it's alcohol, whether it's narcotics, whatever, part of the difficulty in setting them free is the fear that they have of going through the withdrawal. Right? It, it's 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 painful, it's scary, it's bizarre, it's 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 difficult. Um and there are some people that want to shy away from going through that, uh, and as a result, they stay bound. You know, they 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 either they don't try or they don't make it all the way, whatever. For us, let me read you a verse from Luke, which has nothing to do really with uh, with with addictions, but in Luke chapter number one, John the Baptist is going to be born, and his father is praising the Lord because of it. Um. Uh, he, or he has been born. And his dad, Zacharias, as he's giving his praise to the Lord, he says this, uh, just breaking halfway into it, that he, that is God, would grant unto us that we being delivered, there's freedom again, out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Here's the idea that I want to leave you with. The idea that rebellion and sin and making my own decisions and calling my own shots and plotting my own course is liberating and freeing is a lie. Freedom means not being bound. Freedom means being able to walk with God, to know God, to serve God, to love God, you know, think about somebody who, um, think about somebody who's had, I don't know, uh, maybe maybe an accident, some kind of accident. In order for the free, in order for them to get freedom of movement back, you know, let's say they're burned or, or broken or whatever, you know, there there there's therapy, and it can be difficult, painful, you know, discouraging, to work your way back from an injury to get freedom of motion again. You know, you might say, well, as long as I do this. I'm okay. You want to do this your whole life and nothing else? No. Just like with an addiction, coming through withdrawal, I have to go through this to eventually be able to do whatever it is you want to do. You know? Same thing with sin. The idea, you know, and, and uh, if you watch movies and things like uh, sometimes, some of them anyway, oftentimes they have a, uh, you know, they have a mastermind, some criminal who, who, you know, maybe kids start when they're young and they're brainwashed and they, they do whatever that they do. And it's only as time passes that they begin to realize that the story they've been told, the, the, the perspective that they've been given doesn't really match up. And so then finally, you know, they break free and they find out what the real situation is, reality, truth, etc. They become good guys and stuff like that. Then things explode and blow up and, and whatever. But, but the deal is, and, and in, our, in our real life, you know, we have fake news. We have people who are trying to push a narrative that this is true, this is not, this is good, this is bad, things like that. 
but all, all of that, behind all of that, is the devil pushing his narrative that sin is freeing. When the Bible says, no, it's just the other way. Sin is what keeps you from having the life that God intended you to have. Sin is what keeps you from maximizing your pleasure on this life, right? Because the Bible tells us, Psalm 1611, in God's presence, there is fullness of joy. At his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Isn't that what people are looking for? I mean, unsafe people, young people, old people, every every person. Aren't we looking for pleasure? I mean, if you're, I mean, if uh, you're not looking for happiness, then something's not right. I mean, happiness is it's it's a good thing. How to get it and what exactly it consists of? That's where people, you know, get off the track. But pleasures forevermore, isn't that what you're after? Sure, it is. And you don't find that in running from God. You find it in running to God. You find it in surrendering before God. And letting him take away all the lies, all the chains, all the guilt, all the wrong thinking that hinders us from knowing him. And when we do that, that's when we can say, free at last. Free at last. You know, I have been set free. Free from death, free from the fear of man, free from the fear of not having enough stuff, free from know the whole list and, and there's probably others you could add but it's serving God knowing God surrendering to God that sets us free to be what he's made us to be and rebellion and sin and 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 carnality and going our own way only binds us so that's that's the big thought that uh, that occurred to me uh, as uh, we're talking about uh, this is the, I don't know, maybe a month ago or something uh, even before Pastor asked me to speak um, I said yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna save that for this one being set free really free completely free not just politically or economically or whatever but free indeed by Jesus uh, okay I would say pray but okay uh, Liz if the devil lied. But he offered Jesus kingdoms. I don't think so. I think he had them. The Adam gave them to Adam gave them to the devil. I mean, not, he didn't intend to, but uh, he. The, I mean, the Bible says that the devil is the king of this world, prince of the power of the air. And so, I think that the devil could have given them to Christ. Would he have? No, I don't think so. Why would he? If he gets Christ to worship him, then Christ is no longer a threat. I'll just keep my kingdoms. Thanks. And now you've just been added to it. You're one of my you're one of my citizens now. Uh, so you know, I mean, does the devil does the devil ever follow through on the good things that he offers? I don't know. Maybe, maybe sometimes for some people, it's kind of like uh, what is it? Uh, you guys, you're from New York, right? You know who Bernie Madoff is? Madoff, Madoff. You know the uh, what was it? The pyramid guy. Yeah. Sure, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta get money from these guys to pay those guys. Then you advertise to those guys and see what kind of money these guys made. So yeah, you gotta get the machine going a little bit. You know, if the devil only smashed people's lives left and right, you wouldn't have to be very bright to say no thanks, devil. I'm not interested in what you're offering. So he's gotta, he's gotta. You know, the casino's gotta pay out sometimes. But in the end, uh, wow. In the end, it's a wipeout. 